architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk, a podcast dedicated to conversations on the status of contemporary architecture and to advancing that conversation through interdisciplinary means. Over the last few weeks, we have been interrogating this national modernist project in South Asia and in particular in India and trying to evaluate its legacy and implications for thinking the present. Uh, Today we continue that conversation with Dan Williamson, who has recently completed a PhD on the life and times of uh, mid-century post-colonial Ahmedabad, which, if you are not familiar with, is a city in western India which has been home to some of the best and uh, most amazing uh, advances in Indian modernism, hosting uh, not only the likes of Le Cabusier and Louis Kahn, but also uh, many a generation of Indian modernists, such as, of course, Bibi Doshi, Charles Correa, Hasmukh Patel, and so many others. Ahmedabad is also the city uh, that hosted and uh, from where Doshi founded the School of Architecture that is now known as SEP University, surely one of the premier thinking institutions of India. Uh, And it is uh, of late also the city where the uh, neo-nationalist Indian project, uh, the post-Nehruvian modernist project, uh, has been spearheaded uh, in the form of the government of uh, Narendra Modi and his uh, architectural ambitions. So uh, we have a discussion about all of that uh, with Dan Williamson, uh, in terms of his dissertation uh, and what Ahmedabad was in the 50s and 60s and why and how it came to be this very special place. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I hope to do a lot more on this topic in the future. Here we go. Dan, thank you for having this conversation with me. So glad to have you here on Architecture Talk. Many of these conversations that I'm having nowadays are are kind of come out of this panel discussion uh, that I had recently with Widler, Partha, Mark, Jazombek, and uh, Sunil Kilnani, and some of these are reactions and responses to that. So I'm so glad to be able to catch up with you. First, let's get a little introduction about you. So Dan, this is all very South Asian. You're not South Asian. What the hell were you doing in Ahmedabad? How did you get into it? I went to India right after I, I graduated from undergraduate college and and I was a philosophy major who had started drifting towards architecture as something I I, I had kind of just moved towards architecture. I I thought it was a little more uh, grounded in reality, but it was still about kind of expressing ideas and trying to implement them in the world. Um, And I went to India with a friend of mine who who, uh, I eventually married and I, when I was traveling around, of course, we were looking at, at old things, uh, but I was also struck immediately by the modernity of so many of the buildings, or at least mm-hmm. the, the reflection that, you know, and this was something, you know, I was I was fairly naive at the time, but it was not something that I, I really knew about. And I thought, well, this is, uh, this is not how you picture India, or this is not how you, the ideas of, uh, about India are received. What were you looking for? Uh, what was the other India that uh, you and your partner went there looking for? You went on a real yoga retreat, meditation well, retreat? No. To you find know, well, yourself? I, well, you know, I was a kind of uh, a budding art and architectural historian. So I, I was going looking for, you know, the Monuments of the Mughals, uh, Ajanta Caves, um, well, no, Sanji, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. we did a, so we, we did a, a whole big thing, but it was, okay. it was so, so but then modern architecture, you ran into modern architecture. I ran into modern architecture. And um, so I just, you know, I put that away in the back of my mind. And then when I was pursuing what, what eventually kind of became a, a, a master's degree in architectural history, uh, as, you know, this became something I, I decided I, I wanted to kind of 
look at more seriously kind of in the master's degree, but kind of just looking at more of the kind of colonial era, uh, 19th century uh, uh, Mumbai, I wrote about um, uh, about the Crawford markets. I see. And then as I, I you know, as I, I kind of wanted to pursue a PhD, I, I really thought about, uh, you know, obviously Ahmedabad had, as you kind of put put it in your introduction, you know, had this kind of reputation as this crucible, uh, as as a uh, somebody who had been looking at it from the outside. It, it, it presented, I thought, a, an intriguing place to look at, mm-hmm. at a, a kind of modern architectural development. Uh, you know, I was naive enough to think I could write about uh, as such a huge topic, which was maybe. Uh, Every topic is a huge topic the yeah. moment you get into it. Once you get into it, you, you really... from a distance, you would think mid-century Ahmedabad would be a very specialized topic, but actually, of course, it's... You no, know, as, as soon as you step into it, you feel the, the, the floor kind of drop out. And <laughs> it's, it's a little frightening. I like the way you describe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so that's, that's kind of uh, uh, how I ended, ended up. Uh, uh, in Ahmedabad, and I was there, I think, doing most of the research in kind of 2009, 2010. So what 2000. was the research like? I mean, research means what? There are good archives? Uh, how did you get information? So, you know, obviously, if, if we're dealing with the um, kind of post-colonial scene, yeah. you know, we have to deal with, with Khan and, and Corbusier. So, yeah. Uh, those archives obviously are well established. Yeah, were, were well established and, and easy enough to look at. And, and I do think you know even this is part of the reason that this is such a difficult topic is that to really understand it, you have to go to all you know you have to go to these different places as well. Yeah. But uh, in Ahmedabad, you know, it was working out of SEP's library and SEP, of course, is the uh, architecture school. And it was a lot of going on site and uh, meeting as, with as many architects as possible and kind of um, probing them from, for, their, for their stories, uh, meeting a lot of uh, uh, clients, trying to ingratiate myself uh, and meet with as many of uh, these, these uh, textile mill owner families that we can talk more about. Uh, and then to kind of to dig in and, and look for archives. I went to Delhi uh, to Convinda's office. And, uh, for Atira. Uh, for Atira. And unfortunately, they didn't have uh, as much, but they did have drawings for um, uh, the Hari Vallabha's house. Uh, which is, to my mind, a, a you know, really significant project. So it was that kind of thing. You know, it really is kind of building these things. So like know. an amorphous kind of networking. Yeah. Uh, the, but did you like find some great like stored archive, uh, somebody's uh, personal uh, collection or anything that well, you relied on heavily? The municipality had some things that, that were okay. I went to the Sarabai Foundation and they had some interesting items about the history of their house that helped mm. put Corbusier's uh, Sarabai house in a kind of broader context within that, that whole uh, kind of right. compound. I was kind of researching at a time that I think you know, Charles Correa was kind of putting together his archive, which I, I've since seen, um, uh-huh. which is, you know, has some, certainly some use. One issue is that there is not as much documentation as one would hope. So what did you learn? I lived in Ahmedabad for a few years, right. but I'm not from Gujarat. I'm not, I'm, right. I'm not Ahmedabadi. And I might as well be from the United States because right. being a Punjabi is kind of like from another planet compared right. to the Gujaratis. <laughs> right. Right, right. So I felt uh, very much in some ways uh, like an outsider because this feels to me like Ahmedabad has a very distinct slash cosmopolitan but insular, uh, really outward looking and worldly but like strangely parochial culture. Well, I, I think you've, you've... Put it, put it exactly right, I think. Uh, obviously, in order to entice all of these architects to Ahmedabad, uh, you had a very insular group of architectural patrons, these textile mill owners, who were on the one hand very worldly, right? I mean, they had they had offices in New York City and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. But it is uh, uh, still very much a kind of insular place. And, and you know, I, I would see in some of the kind of testimonies about, you know, people, like architects who came and worked for Khan in the 60s who were just I, I, like, I need to get out of Ahmedabad. This place is kind of stultifying. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it is a very strange uh, uh, kind of phenomenon. What produced this situation as you see it uh, that produced this uh, amazing architectural milieu? What, what, what was right. it? Well, I mean, I, I, so I do think it starts with the textile mill owning families. And, and I think this kind of contradiction that you see, or, or I guess it's not a contradiction, but this kind of dichotomy that you see between something that feels kind of very insular and very kind of rooted mm -hmm. in a very particular kind of locale. And, and, but with this kind of uh, uh, worldliness as well, I mean, this is coming from the, these families. And so in particular, it's, it's really two families who are kind of interlinked and interconnected with each other. It's, it's Kasterbal Lalbai. Right, um, Lalbai. And it's, and it's, and it's the, the Sarabai family. And so I did get to talk to Gira Sarabai, who is, is really a very key and instrumental figure in this whole story. One thing that, that I discovered is that the, the kind of architectural patronage had already been going on for a couple of decades, and it had been very India-focused. You know, they had brought in Cloud Batley to design a lot of buildings. I see. And they had brought in, you know, so Gira Sarabai had studied at Rabindranath Tagore's art school, and they had brought uh, Surendranath Kaur to, to do a redo of, of, of the house and, and the retreat. Um, and so this has all been kind of blooming and blossoming in the 30s. I mean, there's some lovely Claude Batley buildings kind of sprinkled throughout Ahmedabad. Um, but I do think with independence, you see this desire to move from a kind of colonial milieu to a kind of, uh, to a broader right. cosmopolitan viewpoint. Yeah, for sure. But, but what I'm learning from you is that they had already sort of adopted some ideas of modernism and modern, modern architecture as critical elements. And, and, and they were, look, and after independence, they in a sense just continued it, but made it more uh, a particular flavor. Mm -hmm. That was in sync, I suppose, with the with the Nehruvian choices as well, given Chandigarh and so on. Yeah, I think so. But you know, it starts it it starts right. I mean, it really does start even before Nehru has has started to reach out. I mean, the, the you know, there's, there's a famous uh, Frank Lloyd Wright project for yeah, Al which Bob was not Netflix. built. Yeah, the, the, it's yeah. built. I mean, and that, that starts out. I mean, even they're they're the first letters for that go out to Frank Lloyd Wright in 1946. Um, and uh, Gira Sarabai told me essentially, you know, what, what was interesting, she had gone to Japan and had asked Antonin Raymond to recommend an architect. And she was actually, so, you know, she had design interests. And I think this is one of the interesting things. And this is one of the really unique things about these, these clients is that, you know, they were, looking to become designers themselves in a sense. Yeah, that yeah, they, yeah. It was a kind of participatory. Uh, why? Uh, why? Why? Of, why? 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 Why were this this particular family? These particular families? I mean, more the Sarabhais. I mean, did the Lalbhais also want to be designers? Well, themselves? no. You know, I think Kastabha Lalbhai saw it as kind of his, his civic duty to yeah, be promoting yeah. a kind of civic architecture, right? Because he saw right. himself. You know, you know, one one thing about um, the Bad is it has this kind of very interesting political history where where they were were led by a kind of particular business leader. Yeah. Another set. And so he saw that, you know, I think he saw that as kind of an extension of his his legacy. Their father, Ambalal, had, had was really kind of uh, also, you know, if you go back to the teens and 20s. Right. I mean, he's trying to cultivate this very cosmopolitan kind of modern identities described as kind of being the first person to be driving around in like a kind of very fancy high-end car. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he's uh, uh, responsible for keeping Gandhi's ashram going uh, uh, when there was a giant controversy about Gandhi letting kind of untouchables into the, into the ashram. So, you know, I think there's this kind of mold breaking kind of attitude towards the family that starts with the, with the father. With the mother. And where did he get that attitude from? Just in the air, in nationalism and so on? Or do you, you know, have I, a more specific thing? I don't want to say it's a, a kind of personality thing, perhaps. But, I, you know, I think his his parents had died when he was young. I don't want to kind of misspeak here. But I, I think yeah, his yeah, parents had died when he was young. And um, it just seemed like he was a, a person who was going to break rules. He broke rules about his, his marriage in terms of who he married and, and so on. 
He married out of caste. So married a Jane, um, yeah. but but not from the proper families. I, there was some, and and so then I think he really tried to cultivate this attitude in his children. You know, I mean, I and there is something I think you, you were talking about kind of parallels with with Nehru. You know, I mean, in terms of Nehru's kind of cosmopolitanism and and yeah. you know they they went abroad quite often when they were young. They lived a very insular life. Umbala basically hired a bunch of uh, European tutors to come teach. He's he basically formed a little school in the retreat itself, and they were all educated there. Uh-huh. And they, um, uh, with some of the um, Kasurbai Lalbai's children who lived next door. And so I, you know, I think he did uh, uh, cultivate this this kind of attitude and outlook. And I think Gira Sarabai, so you know, again, she decided she was going to go into design, and she had gone to Tagore's school and then she was looking to kind of globally expand so when they went to you know Raymond the, which I'm assuming and, and I think she pretty much confirmed this that you know they had seen Golkan essentially yeah right? yeah 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 and we are the based on Tagore that would be an important Japan connection right I mean, right Tagore uh, was in a you know, strong connection with Japan yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, so they went to see Raymond in Japan in Japan yeah and so she said just was, after the war yeah this was just after the war they wanted somebody who they could hire to do some buildings that they would also kind of ha- continue to have this mentor relationship with and so they brought the, so he suggested right and of course he had you know trained with what right. yeah 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 and i think he thought well they can go and and study at, at taliesin which she did do for a, a few months it doesn't seem like uh, you know, there's sometimes you read things where she she did a full kind of Taliesin fellowship. She she didn't end up finishing it. Uh-huh. Um, but I think you know this is this is kind of how how the ball gets rolling is really with this uh, right with the Frank Lloyd Wright project in terms of kind of shifting from looking within India to kind of looking more broadly. And and it does to you know it is paralleling. It, it is right at this moment that of, of independence where suddenly you know I think. All, the world is opened up, right, in, in, in an interesting way. So that's interesting. So it, there's, there's sort of a tunneling from a national modernists, we are more the Ravindranath Tagore route, right, uh, up to Japan, you know, over the Pacific into the United States and the milieu and the sort of the context of uh, Wrightian modernism. Right. So yeah. then how does it cross the Atlantic uh, and, and, uh, and get to... Core. Well, so, that's because um, he came to Chandigarh, or uh, yeah. The Frank Lloyd Wright building uh, doesn't quite happen. Why didn't happen? Why didn't... I, it ran afoul of the building codes? You know, he sent this gigantic uh, a packet of calculations, and I don't. You know, there were still kind of some very strict building codes that the uh, were kind of hangovers from what the British had imposed. Uh-huh. And I, I think the contractor didn't understand what he was trying to do. It was. It's a really great project, and it is actually. Yeah. I think it's a it's a key project and for his own kind of development in terms of you know what he does there kind of helps lead to the Morris shop, which yeah. helps lead to the to the Guggenheim. Uh, I see. That's an interesting thing. So you think it it's it, it was uh, preliminary to Guggenheim? It felt know, more like as one of his California projects. You know. Well, so the, it has it's a so it's this interesting hybrid, right? Because it has the it has a textile block, yeah. kind of shell that wraps around it and uh, you know i think there's some really interesting kind of ideology emerging about why the textile block for india you know that's wrapping around essentially a um a series of kind of platforms oh and it's topped by some like uh like some cantilevered uh falling water things uh, yeah. but the interior was designed to have this kind of and it wasn't it, it wasn't kind of completely a, a spiraling ramp but it is like all a single room like the idea was that the the walls were the, the floors were independent of the walls, and there was right. a sense that you were inside this thing. And then, you know, what what Gautam and Gira Sarabai were really focused on in their their letters to and from each other, because they both basically were writing letters while well, she was at, at Taliesin, mm-hmm. uh, was this idea of display, and this kind of. Uh, you know, they really wanted to kind of modernize and transform how how goods were sold. And there's almost this kind of museification of the objects that was supposed to take place within this kind of open space that had, you had a kind of spiraling ramp through it. That's that's what eventually happens with the Moore shop. But it is kind of forerunner to the Moore shop. And, and, and also in terms of, I think, this kind of uh, fetishization of, of the consumer good. 
Um, so it's the Apple Store. Yeah, basically, you know, you're going to have one object there, and then yeah. they, you know, they this uh, this is what they spent all their time talking about was this idea of having like we're going to have the one object, and then you go up and you tell the clerk you want this object, and we're going to have a bunch of pneumatic tubes that run through the building. And that's going to send down to the basement and we'll kind of bring out the object. Griffin was also practicing in India at this time, right? I mean, he also has a he, deep right connection. Yeah, Yeah, so he had deep right connections. And that, that might have also been part of it, right? Because there is a kind of municipal theater project that he did. It's more in the 30s, though. Uh, yeah. So he came through on the bat in the 30s. And there's this drawing that you can see. I, so there's this whole right thing. And Gira yeah. Sarbai is in Talias. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Gotham and Gear are um, putting this project together, you know, running through municipal, running into municipal difficulties, yep. as as always, uh, yeah. as everything does. Mm -hmm. So then what happens? As terms of what happens to that project, of course, they end up kind of doing their, their kind of calico dome. On, yeah, yeah. Because they had excavated the site on, yeah. on Relief Road. Yeah. So, so they did their calico dome and then they did a... Um, there, you know, the original textile museum was on their, uh, uh, the grounds of their mill, and they did this Wrightian thing for that. And then this is about the time that you also have uh, Convenda coming over. The way I kind of connect these things is it does seem like the mill owners were really trying to radically modernize uh, the textile industry and to create kind of modernized consumer markets, right? So the shop right. is really about kind of modernizing things on the consumption end. Right. Um, Atira is the, you know, is this textile industry research association. It's going to, they're going to do all these experiments that are going to allow them to kind of apply those experiments on the production. And it's part of this idea of, well, we're independent and now we can kind of forge our own kind of vision of modernity. Um, right. Although it still is in this kind of development model where they are kind of incorporating this, it's about creating consumption based markets and right. industrializing. Um, so Convinda came in, uh, but that was through Vikram Sarabhai, their, you know, Gira's brother. Right. Um, and he came in to do Atira. This was, was Vikram's big idea about kind of modernizing the industry. And, and you know, Convinda had gone to study at Harvard with Gropius, and his, his thesis was about designing modernized industrial buildings. That was what he'd gone to study. He was he went there at, on a scholarship that, that where it was specifically, you know, the money was there to go do that. So Convinda's there kind of about the same time that the, the Frank Lloyd Wright project falls apart. One thing I think that's interesting here is that especially compared to Chandigarh, right, there is a much more almost a, a kind of eclectic idea. Is there any underlying thought process to this, right? Like, is, is it that it's gropious for the factory buildings and right for the, you know, I, I'm not sure it was that much. No, no, that. no, not that master plan. Right. Um, but, uh, but there was definitely, it seems like, I mean, it results in the Mill Owners Association building and already right. we have a TIRA. So there's a sort of a shared culture. Is there not amongst the mill owners? Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. and, and the, where does the, that come from and how did that develop it? Why did that develop? Why weren't they just competitive with each other and gouging each other's profits and, you know, trying to be completely different from each other? You know, I mean, I mean, it's so amazing that a textile series of families would not only patronize modernism, but do it in a semi almost collective way. That has deep roots in the history of Ahmedabad. The way that businesses were run is that they all had guilds, right? And they had, all had yeah. like kind of heads of guilds. And so... Yeah. When the textile industry uh, kind of establishes itself, it builds itself out of that older guild mentality. And, and so mm -hmm. they're, very, they're very much capitalists, right? But I think there's a sense that they can rec they recognize that, that kind of collectively they can uh, maximize their profits kind of working together. So Atira is basically funded by the Mill Owners Association. You know, they prior to the building, obviously, they, they'd been around, the association already existed and they had offices kind of in the old city. Right. That is one of the kind of interesting and unique aspects of, of this story, right? I mean, we have stories about kind of the integration of and the use of modern architecture to kind of promote industrialist ideas and industrial ends. But this is certainly a, a, a unique way of, of handling the linkage between the two. I mean, I was, uh, whose book was I recently? Oh, I was reading The Idea of India again with Sunil mm -hmm. Tilnani. And this time I paid attention, you know, he, he's describing this uh, situation 
after 1947. And a couple of points that he makes is, one is that nothing was settled. You know, yeah. what post-colonial India was going to be. It was not like uh, there were blueprints ready to go. And, right. and, and, and it was deeply contested and it could have gone many ways. Yeah. Of course, there were certain accidents like the deaths of Gandhi and Patel, etc., which were mm-hmm. instrumental in putting Nehru in the driver's seat. But even in the Nehruvian world, a, a blueprint wasn't there. And uh, Nehru wanted, and I suppose Nehru is a bit of a metonym. I mean, I suppose it'd be, it'd be the Indian nationalist cosmopolitan culture, if you like, was very keen to... Uh, establish modern India on its own foundation. You know, we, the, the, normally modernization is uh, written up, Indian modernization is written up as a catch up with the West uh, strategy. Mm-hmm. And to a certain extent, of course, uh, that was true to sort of make up for the uh, industrial backwardness, if you like. But it wasn't just that. Clearly, it was very much you know, we want to do this differently and we don't want to do it right. That was very much in the air. So uh, do you think, do you find that kind of a discourse in letters or literature or or interviews? Well, absolutely, yeah. You know, when you look at at the mission of Atira itself, uh, which which Nehru came and and, uh, inaugurated uh, Atira, which yeah. is, is important, right? Because Atira is, this is where the mill owners are kind of plugging into the kind of Nehruvian ideal is, is that Atira really is in many ways kind of the embodiment of this idea of we're going to industrialize, but we're going to industrialize on our own terms. We're right. going to take the best uh, 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 that we can, you know, we will bring in experts from Europe or Britain or where have you, but, yeah. but the goal is to have those experts train us and then, you know, then we're going to kind of do do it our own way, or, or bring them in also from the Soviet Union, right? Because yeah, yeah, you know that's that's also very much a part of it. Um, so you see that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, even this idea of like a kind of Nehruvian socialism was definitely kind of uh, uh, up in the air, right? In terms of the actual construction of, of the economy. Um, so like, there's this, um, you know, there's this very famous kind of Bombay plan that was floated by oh yeah, uh, by the industrialists, yeah, industrialists. So the Castor by Lalbai was part of that. Was this action? And, yeah, and, and the and, you know this was the idea here. And the Sarabhais well. were not part of that. The Sarabhais were not part of that. No, I see. They, they didn't participate. Um, yeah. But yeah, the Bombay plan's famous. Yes, right, right. Yeah. And so that that's an interesting kind of idea of like, well, how far will the capitalists go in terms of ceding to socialist demands? And I think what the mill owners kind of realized is, well, actually, we can use the socialist economy to our advantage because it's we can basically use the government in some ways to kind of subsidize a lot of what we're what we're right. doing. Right, right. I mean, I'm trying to put down with you the roots mm-hmm. of uh, Ahmedabad modernism uh, and I suppose ultimately the school of architecture and NID and so right. on uh, as a not catch up with the West strategy but as yeah. a sort of a, a uh, enrooting of, of a different modernist experiment and ethos. Yeah, I, well, I, I do think that, you know, and I guess it, it gets into this whole trick, tricky question of modernism and how universal it is to begin with, right? I would say the idea of bringing a variety of experts into a situation and pulling different ideas from different people as, as a, a means to kind of forge your own way seems to certainly be part of, of these early experiments in kind of their architectural, the architectural patronage of, of uh, the Sarabais and the Lalbais and, and does find, I think, parallel in the experiments that are going on in the institutions that that they're designing, right? In terms of what Atira's goal was, mm-hmm. um, and is is you know follows through in terms of uh, the Indian Institute of Management and and its very complicated right. relationship with the Ford Foundation, with the Harvard Business School, but also right. you know in, I mean in terms of the the kinds of uh, professors they're bringing in. Kind of the flip side of all this is. You know, Kanwinde comes into towns and then leaves town. Like Charles Correa comes into town and then leaves town because he's like, eh, not my town. Uh, and, and I remember Daushi once telling me the story that he came to Chandigarh first. 
uh, after his Kabuzia years. And uh, he felt he had to get out of town, you know, like yeah. uh, the, the Punjabis didn't want him uh, some hierarchy issues. They get out of town, but they can they come back and design more buildings, you know. I mean, there's, there's you know, they design some houses. And, you know. Yeah, they do. They do. They do. So anyway, there's that in and out. We don't need to get too far down that road. But but uh, slowly out of all of this emerges Doshi. You have, of course, the, the impetus of, of bringing in Le Corbusier. And, and this is interesting. You know, it's, it's always people people think about first, they think about the houses and they think about the Mill Owners Association building, but he was actually brought in to design the, the museum. That was why they brought Since Scott came through, yeah. Yeah. So they approached him through the municipality, but really behind the scenes, it was Gir and Gautam Sarabai because they're the ones who directly worked with him in terms of building the program of the whole cultural center up. And so, of course, that's that's really how Doshi comes into the scene as well. Uh, is you know he had been working in in Le Corbusier's office for a number of years. He works. He he was one of the main people in in Le Corbusier's atelier who who worked on the Mill Owners Association building. There's a number of drawings in his hand. Yeah, but you're saying uh, that comes later, right? I mean, first, Corb is brought in for uh, for the museum, and well, really, the Sarabhai, uh, Gautam and Gira are his clients. And, right. and Kabuzia brings in Doshi as his uh, a man on site, yes? Right, right. But the, Well, so all the projects happen simultaneously. So Kabuzia comes, and then by the time he leaves, there's actually four or five projects, you know, there's, there's yeah. the unbuilt mayor's house. Yeah. At one point he was going to design a, a mill building, like there's a little drawing for that. So, so yeah. they brought him in and then, you know, they, they piled the projects on and then it, it uh, receded. So he was working on all four of them simultaneously, but the initial invitation was, was about the, the municipal museum. And the invitation was from who? It was from the municipality. It was so, but from uh, but managed by Gotham and Gira. It wasn't. Yeah, because by... when he came, you know, so when he came, he stayed at the retreat. You know, so you know, again, the the they have this kind of massive house. There's all these guest wings. They have so many people just coming through there, right? So when when uh, Rabindranath Tagore comes, he stays at their house. When mm. and they're also in terms of their kind of cosmopolitan attitude, they're inviting like Alexander Calder. They're inviting. Yeah you know, John Cage and Merce Cunningham and, and so right. on and so forth. And, and when most of these people, when they come, it's really through the Sarabais and they usually stay in these kind of guest suites uh, in the retreat that are now, you know, part of the, the museum there. Well, what was going on at the dinners and so on and so forth, right? That's where you really have, I think, a, a kind of gap, right? Because that's where all the rich conversation was happening about what does it mean to be modern? And you get hints of this and, and some of the letters and some of people's recollections. You know, Mernalini Sarabai, who was married to Vikram, who's this kind of yeah. great dancer, you know, talks about having debates uh, uh, between her and Gira about what modernity means and whether it's gonna be rooted in the past or whether it's something that's complete break and whether it's universal. So they were having these debates yeah. uh, that, that you can kind of read around the edges of I see. So did you spend time in the retreat? I did. Yeah. So I spent, you know, I, I went through a few times uh, through the museum and then um, that's the, they have a kind of foundation archive there that I, I kind of, I, I went through and, and again, you know, again, it was, didn't have as much a, as I hoped for, but it did actually have this kind of really great documentation of, of the history of their house, of the house itself that, that allows you to kind of put it in context. So yeah. the Sarabais don't have a personal archive. Of um, all they, the, they, you have all, well, they, they have did all call the it's their foundation archive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Mm. But it's not as extensive as one would hope, or as, at least what I saw, you know, it's, it's also about <laughs> what people will show you. Right, so, right, right, right. What we will show you is yeah. a big issue. Okay, so that's how Corb got into all of this, invited by the Sarabhais, and then Doshi's practice gets going right. on the backs of that. And then how does IAM happen? So I, IAM happens, so Doshi, you know, decides uh, uh, that he's going to establish his practice in Ahmedabad after he kind of completes the oversight of and so, you know, what happened was, yeah, he went to Chandigarh and then what he ended up doing is kind of replacing uh, a Verre, who was, was uh, Le Corbusier's on-site architect. And he kind of came to Ahmedabad to, to finish the oversight of, of all, all the projects. And then, um, 
And then, uh, so he establishes who, who his own the, practice. Who was he? He replaced who? Jean-Louis Verre, I think. So he was a, he was a member of Le Corbusier's architecture firm. And they sent him. He had a lot of issues cross-culturally with uh, yeah. uh, the clients. So yeah, yeah, okay. they brought Doshi in to smooth things over. You know, I asked a lot of the different architects how they ended up kind of with their first commissions. And what they would say is like, you know, Castor by Lalbai would give them like a little tiny project, like these little buildings that, that either don't survive or that they don't even really talk about very much. Yeah. Um, and, and he would see if they could do that. And if they did that to his liking, then, you know, you would kind of open things up. So there are some interesting early buildings by Doshi that aren't even, you know, are still not kind of well known. And actually, they probably just got demolished in the past couple of years. Um, but he did these like little buildings around the Gujarat University because all of that land was run by the Ahmedabad Education Society, which was basically uh, custer by Lalbai's institution yeah. to promote education. That's, um, right. That's right. Still very active, still very powerful. Yeah. So like Doshi designed like a little uh, uh, badminton court. I don't know if you ever saw it. It was behind SEPT. And it's actually where SEPT started before they built their campus as they worked out of the badminton court. It's just really, I don't, again, I think it got badminton destroyed. Court, really? Yeah. It was it's really beautiful. He basically took these, um, created this kind of butterfly uh, 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 roof and it's that kind of double double shell roof yeah and and inside actually so you have these kind of balconies that were set up and and I talked to um Aaron Vakil and he was like well what we would do is we would sit up above the students would be all working on kind of the badminton court and we'd be on this kind of balcony and and he kind of implied that that's kind of where they got this idea of the kind of interlocking studio spaces for Seth was the that was I see separate. from that situation. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Vakil, Ratsubhai Vakil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Doshi, you know, gets these little projects and then he goes, he gets uh, basically Le Corbusier wrote to Siegfried Gideon and was like, I have this great Indian architect. I'm going to give him, I want you to give him a, a, a Graham fellowship to go to the US. Yeah. And he yeah. wrote, he wrote Doshi and he said, I need you, you need to go to the US so you can kind of get immersed in alternative culture and see what you're rejecting more or less, right? Because of course, Le Corbusier's kind of whole vision for India was it was going to be this anti-consumerist, you know, kind of vision yeah, yeah. of modernity. Again, right? again, it's, yeah. I mean, the second machine age, Corbusier's right. vision. Uh, right. Now I'm realizing more and more, it was more a, good, more a response to the ethos of the time around People, it, you know, it's the other way around. Nehru and all these people were trying to forge an alternate India. Yeah. And, well, and Kabuzia was sort of drumming in on that. It wasn't the other way around. It's like Cobb showing up saying India should be this. Right. Yeah. Right. Although, you know, I mean, I, you know, the, I, I do think there's a tension, obviously, between this kind of almost deindustrial version that Le Corbusier has in his mind and the fact that he's working with Nehru and with these textile industrialists, you know, I mean, th there's- It's a not of... deindustrial, it's post-capitalist. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. I mean, and there is... it's, it's industrial, but second machine age, as he called it. Yeah, that's yeah. true, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you're right. Yeah, it's just, but and the, the industry is going to be kind of more integrated holistically into the society, I guess. So that's right. That's right. That's right. Vision for holistically it. integrated and right. uh, basically captains of industry and state run, you know. Right, yeah. exactly. And this is, you know, this is very much uh, uh, Le Corbusier. You know, the, Le Corbusier's relationship with the clients is very interesting right. because he does, and of course, he does this over and over again. He kind of puts, He's like, I found my person who's going to be yeah, the yeah. authority. And yeah. then they, they disappoint him because they're- Always, <laughs> always, always, yeah. always. So that but happens, I of course, the, with, the, with the mill owners as well. But. Of course, of course, of course. In the end, Kabuzi was disappointed with everyone, but that, yeah. you know, he could never, his mom didn't like him. So he was never going to be, yeah. uh, anyway, let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah. So- so he sent, a, you know, it's this, uh, there's a, a, a letter, it's a recollection of Doshi where he, where he said, okay, you need to go and kind of immerse yourself in America, a, again, as a kind of cautionary tale almost. Um, so he goes there with his Graham Foundation and he goes down to University of Pennsylvania and he gives a lecture on uh, the Atira housing that he had just done. And Louis Kahn really responds very positively to them. 
and they, they you know, forge a friendship. And then Doshi goes off and he goes through Japan and meets Kenzo Tange and Tange's engineers and so on. And so that also has a big impact on him. So the Indian Institute of Management basically was, you know, it was going to be a government uh, uh, program. Vikram Sarabhai and Kasabai Lalbai had for many years been trying to promote this idea that we need to build a cadre of managers and, right. and kind of transform into a managerial capitalism Right. Um, so they, they went to Doshi and they were like, can you design this campus? And he said, right. I, it's too much for me. I, but I, I met this great architect who I think is the equivalent of Le Corbusier. Uh -huh. um, and so they, that, that's kind of how this was kind of negotiated. And then, of right. course, there's also, it's, it's also very complicated because of all of the there's, there's also obviously the role of the Ford Foundation. Right. Uh, they. The National Institute of Design is the architect of record, so so that's also very much a part of this story. And and so you know part again part of the idea here and and you know National Institute of Design is being run by Gautam Sarabhai and, and tech officially and Giro Sarabhai is playing a very important role there. Right, right, right. So once again, it is this idea of like we're going to have this, we're going to have the buildings, but we're also going to have this kind of experience of gaining knowledge from the architect happening right. you know that, that really goes i think all the way back to when they were designing their house in the, in the 30s with a, a cylinder nut car yeah um, so that's that's how that kind of ends up unfolding more or less how smoke tail enters like late 60s right late I 60s mean. yeah so that was that was a tricky he was tricky to fit in because i did yeah. need to uh, i spent a lot of time i mean he was uh, very generous with his time so i spent a yeah. lot of time talking he's to a him. great guy yeah 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 you know i went to his house uh oh beautiful was, house gorgeous yeah, house. Really, really beautiful house yeah so this is an interesting thing right because his he really he does a prod he told me so again he, he's one of the people who told me okay so you have to go if you want to kind of get designed for the in Ahmedabad, you go and you design a project for Castor by Lalbai, and if he likes it, you get a carte blanche. So he designed yeah. some little project for them. His big clients, at least early on, are really more kind of the St. Xavier's, right? Kind of these- um, Yeah, 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 the Jesuits. Educational, right, the Jesuits, yeah. essentially, yeah. right? So yeah. got the, the little uh, school, and then he's yeah, got- Yeah, he's the, like his own um, little Eddie, right? I mean, he's sort of yeah. in this whole milieu. Yeah, well, and, the, and you know, I think that's what's interesting as well is that that I think, and especially as you kind of look at his projects as you kind of move into the 70s and 80s, you know, I, one of the reasons I tried to cap things at 68, I mean, I think part of it is mm -hmm. we're talking about, well, when was the end of this yeah, 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 yeah. mid-century modern era? And yeah, I'm the bottom, yeah. Yeah. you know, part right. of it is, I, you know, I tried to find what are, what are things that suggest things have changed. You know, there were big language riots in 69 that, that seemed to have sucked a lot of really positive energy, yeah. yeah. in terms of like, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but also that's, you know, it's around the 60s and into the 70s that you start to see the, the break of the kind of mill owner's stranglehold on the city. You start to see this kind of opening up and diversification of the kinds of clients I mean, the, the architectural language continues in, in really interesting ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to write about him, but it was hard for me to get into his scene. I mean, I do have, I, I was really interested in, in the modernist houses that crop up all over the city and, and this idea as well of like being able to reimagine. You mean like Charles Korea and so on? Obviously you have the You're first, talking you know, 60s still, right? Uh, yeah, so in the 60s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you, you have Charles Correa's got a number of houses. I, most of them have been demolished, unfortunately. Uh, Bernard Cohn, who came to help set up SEPT University, does a number of interesting houses. Um, you know, again, this uh, uh, Hari Vallabh's house by um, Convenda, I think, is just uh, really fantastic. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. I'm looking forward to yeah. looking at it. Yeah. It's, yeah. So I was really interested in, in you know, ideas about, well, what is, what is it, you know, I, this was also a time, you know, because everything was kind of open in the air, this question of, of what is the, what does the Indian family look like in a kind of post-independence modernist world? And, and um, you know, there were people who were arguing that the, uh, you, you know, as you modernize, you're going to kind of break into nuclear family units and it means the end of the extended family networks. Um, but, you know, the, the way that these kind of modernist houses kind of negotiate kind of extended family 
uh, uh, relationships I found quite fascinating as well. So what happened? I mean, as we are, we are so what happened? How did it all come apart? Uh, late 60s or 70s or whatever it was. You know, how do you conclude your narrative? It didn't really end with a bang, right? I mean, it ended with a, a, a whimper, right? And and to me, part of it is, okay, well, the, the clients, there was, a, you know, in addition to these kind of riots that, that kind of marked, I think, the end of, of a kind of real optimism about um, the BOD, um, there was a big financial crash for the mill owners. And mm-hmm. then there was this kind of long slide till the early to mid 80s when basically the entire, the bottom fell out of the, of the mill owners industries, uh, which led to kind of massive layoffs and a, a closure of all of the mills. And so that's really the official end. So, you know, that completely changes, I think the, the obviously the civic and political dynamics of the city, but even throughout the 60s, you start to see the weakening uh, of, of their dominance, um, and, you know, and on, on from, from multiple kind of political sides, you know, you got communist mayor in the city in the kind of mid 60s, and that's pretty much what I think kills the, the chance for, for the Sanskar Kalakendra to become anything like what they, they had envisioned for it. Uh, and then, I, you know, I think this, on the one hand, you have the slide, but, but on, on the other hand, you could see it as well. Uh, you know, the positive view would be, well, it's like opening up now of the kinds of clients that you, that you have in, in the city, right? Uh, in terms of a much more diverse set of clients, although also perhaps being less civically oriented and, and more uh, uh, interested in architecture primarily as part of a capitalist real estate development issue. Sure, sure. No, the culture completely shifts nationally in the 70s, yeah. you know. Right. 70s is a kind of a watershed moment uh, in global history, but certainly right. in South Asian history. Yeah with uh, Indira Gandhi trying to reinvent uh, the Nehruvian moment, but uh, basically unsuccessfully. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so what was the, what is your, uh, as we move to the end here, uh, what did you learn? What did you, what's your takeaway from all of this? This narrative, this experience, uh, not this experience uh, or, or the learning of this, to understand Ahmedabad, I think you, you really do have to understand the specific social realities that were going on there. And so the, you know, the, the interesting question here is uh, uh, something that I think dovetails in a lot of what you've been thinking about and talking about lately is, is what is the nature of modernity, especially as it kind of manifests itself in South Asia. And where is the line between modernity as a global phenomenon and these specific kind of localized manifestations that really do right. take a globalizing phenomenon? Because of course the, the buildings themselves are using the same materials that you're seeing in, in kind of the entire brutalist canon. But to me, what, what, what I found is, you know, what makes this a kind of localized phenomenon is the way that there is this reaction to uh, both the already existing kind of social uh, uh, order and and how to translate that into a modern realm, yeah, yeah. as well as a response to already existing very rich cultural history in Ahmedabad uh, in terms of the architecture and a response to to all of these kind of localizing conditions. The yeah, beautiful narrative of you know what I'm trying to uh, well not me a lot of people are trying to uh, uh, advocate as the mechanics of uh, of global modernism. Yeah. Uh, where it's not about the proliferation of a certain style, the Euro originated, but it's a translocal phenomena uh, with the variegated uh, uh, roots and imperatives uh, that uh, both taps into and significantly influences uh, what might be considered to be an, interna- uh, an international aesthetic vocabulary. So thank you very much uh, for this work, Dan. Uh, I hope you get to teach it. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I hope to continue to read with your further research on this. And maybe, you know, you're going to find some way to collaborate somewhere. Yes, I hope so. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. 
This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.